Hey friends, welcome to the show. Another episode of the best podcast around the refined savage. Let's talk a little bit about strength since that's what we're all about here at the show. Cerberus strength. You've seen him at Highland Games. You've seen him at Strongman competitions. You've seen him in powerlifting competitions. These guys are the best. They have all this awesome gear for your strength journey. Check them out. Belts, wrist wraps, whatever you need. Smelling salts, they have the throwing bags I've been telling you guys about. You should definitely check out their indoor throwing bags. Um, they have sandbags from throwing bags all the way up to, I think, 200 kilo uh, loadable sandbags. Uh, great people. They are dedicated to strength, and they can help you with anything you need as far as Highland Games, Strongman, Powerlifting, whatever you need. Check them out at Cerberus-Strength.us and use the code REFINESAVAGE10 at checkout for 10% off. Now, you guys all know about Viking Coffee. I know a lot of you are taking advantage. Evan is growing by leaps and bounds out there. He just had to get a new building because he is busting at the seams. So, what I want you guys to do is break in this new facility of his by heading over to vikingcoffeecode.com and getting yourself my personal preference is the old man strength brew, obviously, through the podcast. That's our own refined savage coffee but he has all different flavors pick up a couple bags while you're there he also has hats and mugs a lot of other cool stuff check him out at vikingcoffeecode.com and use the code vikingcoffee10 at checkout if you have any questions get a hold of him on instagram tell him i sent you he will be more than happy to help you warrior cbd you know you you watch these mma fighters you watch these jujitsu guys get torqued up they get hurt they get beat on and the people they go to to help them with injuries and help them relax and relieve some anxiety is the good people at Warrior CBD. The product is fantastic. I highly recommend it. They have like roll-on pain relief gel, which I love. So the CBD roll-on, you roll it onto your joint and then you rub it in with your hands and it just gets deep in there and just relieves all the tension in those muscles and joints. Uh, they have products for your dog. So even if your dog is wigged out, they have CBD oil from them. Remember, CBD oil is not all created equal. You have to get a good quality product. I can attest to the product quality. WarriorCBDOfficial.com. Use the code WARRIOR20 off at checkout, and you will not be disappointed. Serious Steel. Serious Steel has everything you need for your home gym, for your commercial gym, for your CrossFit box, for your garage gym, for your high school gym, whatever kind of gym you need outfitted. Check out Serious Steel. If you're just a guy lifting weights and you need things like knee wraps or wrist wraps or anything like that, anything you need for strength, these guys have it. Check them out, SeriousSteel.com. Use the code SAVAGE at checkout for 10% off. Stay Classy Meats is the way to go. I am a 100% carnivore diet advocate. Not for everybody. For me personally, I love it. And I have been on the carnivore diet since January. I have been eating Stay Classy Meats since June. 100% fueled by Stay Classy Meats right now. The way they work it with me is I get the Elite Box. So once a month, Elite Box shows up. It's 35 pounds of meat. All different kinds. Um, I love the selection because I'm not eating the same thing every day. Wonderful meats that come from animals that are raised on small batch farms around the Bozeman, Montana, <laughs> Bozeman, Montana area. Great meat, great taste, great for you. Trust me when I say these guys are the best. Head on over to stayclassymeats.com. Use the code SAVAGE at checkout for 10% off. Iron and Stone Strength, just outside of Buffalo, New York. They are living the strength dream up there. Awesome gym, awesome people, awesome gear. Check out their apparel line at ironandstonestrength.com. T-shirts, hats, sweatpants, sweatshirts, anything you need. They also have a competition coming up called Feats of Strength in December. You can check them out there. I highly recommend their competitions. Very smoothly run. And if you are looking for a competition to check out, that's the one to do. Use the code REFINESAVAGE at checkout for 20% off. Justin Rohde wants you to know that Rohde Sport has everything you need for your throwing journey. First of all, they're going to be doing their Jolly Big Throws Clinic December 21st at Youngstown State University. He's going to have some of the best coaches and athletes in the nation there coaching people in the shot discus. 
hammer, weight throw, all that kind of stuff. You can give him a holler and have any questions for him at roadiesport.com. He also has the shot put glove there. The shot put glove is great if you are throwing high volume or heavyweight shots. Will protect your hand. Also, nice, beautiful, gorgeous closed loop leather lifting straps. I said that all without fucking it up. That's amazing. Awesome. All right. Check him out at Rhodey Sport. R O D H E S P R T dot com. Use the code SAVAGE SPORT. All caps, all one word, for a discount at the site. Last but not least today, we have Speakeasy Leather. Speakeasy, great people, man. They sent me a wallet last week. I could not be happier with this thing. Beautiful, beautiful wallet. Uh, had Refined Savage uh, monogrammed on the inside of it. This stuff is classy looking. It's minimalist design leather goods, handcrafted for a lifetime of style, use, and quality. I am a big fan of their products. Check them out at Speakeasy Leather on Instagram and just look at some of their products. See if anything's up your alley, man. I, I bet some of it will be. Knife holders wallets, anything like that, key fobs, very cool stuff. And you can send them a message on there and ask any questions you might have. Very cool stuff. Today on the show, let's talk about Corey Muleman. Corey is a chiropractor from the Finley, Ohio area. Brilliant, brilliant guy. This was an incredibly interesting conversation. Uh, We talked about injuries. We talked about training. We talked about um, uh, all sorts of stuff with light use of light in the mornings and and uh, trying to get rid of some of your LED screen usage problems that are that might be screwing up your uh, eyesight and your brain function and the guy is brilliant and has some really interesting ideas. I highly recommend you listen to this podcast, share it with your friends, and hey, enjoy yourselves. Drink some Viking coffee, and we'll see you at the end. Corey, welcome to the show. Hey, thanks for having me. Yeah. Um, so let's start this off right. So the first thing I did was, um, and we were talking earlier that I, I didn't know you, mm-hmm. but I, po- I posted out um, an inquiry to, to a bunch of people that have been on the show before, and four different ones had sent me in your direction. And uh, one of them was Malcolm Majeski. And the first question I was supposed to ask you is, <laughs> uh, right. do you still still go and hold front and center in the mosh pits at rock concerts? Uh, not as much as I would like. Um, I was actually just, I was thinking about that the other day. Well, because well, Slipknot came out their new album a couple days ago, and I was listening to it. And then I was uh, going down rabbit hole on YouTube, watching different videos like that, and I saw them playing. They played at the Iowa State Fair a couple of days ago, and I was watching that. I was like, "Man, I need to make it back to one of those shows." Right, like those. So, not as much as I used to and would like to, but if I ever get back there, I definitely right give it a go. What are you into? Like, what 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 uh, bands? If I'll even know them, I'm you know an old timer, so I'm like um, Iron Maiden and <laughs> yeah, sure. Um, I mean, a lot of metal. I mean, nothing crazy. Um, like I said, like Slipknot, they just came out with a new one. Killswitch Engage came out with a new album. Um, I'll def- I'll, we'll give those more of a listen. Um, Five Finger Death Punch, Bull for My Valentine, um, Bobo Flex, I mean, Avenge Sevenfold. I mean, yeah, I'm sure you've probably heard of yeah, yeah, a lot of those. Of those. I've, I've heard yeah. of those, yeah. I like Five Finger Death Punch for sure. Um, it's weird because we were watching, I, I wasn't watching. With him because he's too young, but we were watching uh, Dirt, the uh, the Motley Crue yeah, documentary, yeah, yeah. and I was talking to my wife with my son there, and I said, you know, I kind of was lamenting the fact that the world may never see rock stars like that again. You know, yeah. there that's the closest thing we still have is is like a, a five finger death punch kind of thing. Yeah. You, you're not going to see that Vince Neil, you know cocaine frenzy with hookers you know that 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 was so prevalent when i was a kid you know everyone wanted to be the you know baddest motherfucker on the planet and they're in right. hair bands you know <laughs> he's not going to see that anymore it doesn't happen um so give me the rundown how where are you from originally columbus grove columbus grove okay and you uh were a thrower in high school yep what else did you do anything else or yeah i did basketball um i did football for a year my freshman year um and i had some back injuries I thought were sort of minor at the time and then so I was like I mean it was first year I'd played football so I was like eh maybe not really right. for me so I so after that I just did basketball and uh, track 
And uh, what was the distance in in high school for the discus? Uh, 188. Okay. And got recruited to go to Ashland originally? or um, I sort of, if I remember correctly, I think I sort of approached Judd mm -hmm. um, my senior, going into my senior year, I think. I didn't really didn't get recruited. I got recruited by Tiffin. Um, who was there at the time? Was that Adrian there at the time? or No, that was probably the same guy who's still there now. I can't remember his name. Um, Coach Corey was there. Okay. Yeah. Yep. Yep. But yeah, it was, it was before it was before Adrian was there. Okay, and so how did you end up at Ashland? I um, my teammate in high school, Blaine Mag, who's the oh, yeah. coach right. at Finley now. Mm -hmm. I'm desperately um, trying to get him on. Oh, yeah. He is no, not. He's no. like I'm boring. You don't want to talk to me. <laughs> <laughs> well, I thought the same thing about myself, and I'm here. So, yeah. Um, but yeah, so he went to Ashland to uh, you know he's on the track team. He played football there for a while too. Um, I knew they had a great program, and uh, and so yeah, I went there. Yeah, just to see what it was all about, and what were your impressions? How would it go? And all American, right? In the discus. Yeah, one in the disc, two in the weight. Okay. Um, I mean, the first impressions were. I mean, all I, all I really remember was I got the the speech from Judd about how you know entering into his you know Olympic game and going down the tunnel and yeah. you know, that whole thing, yeah. and I was like. Yeah, all right, I'll go here. Yeah, right. that's, that's a good idea. Yeah, uh, where he's talking about, he thought he was in an earthquake, yeah. and the chips were coming down from the ceiling, and it was the people just stomping their feet and chanting USA. Yeah, it, it's hard to hear that speech and like walk away from that uh, sort of scenario and that kind of environment. Yeah, right. You're yeah. never going to get that anywhere else. No, no. I've looked and tried to sort of recreate that environment, and it's, it's, it's just not going to happen. Yeah, yeah. It, it, he is... Um, He's the living embodiment of, of all that. And I talk, we, we just interviewed him uh, uh, Thursday, matter of fact, because he's had this amazing year. And, and uh, I told him, I said, you know, you get mentioned on this show more than I do. You know, he's, <laughs> everyone that comes in the show, whether they were Ashland grads or not, have some kind of right. part of his web, which oh, yeah. is amazing, you know. And all these people that have gone on to amazing things, you know, I... I uh, I look at uh, guys like yourself and Rich Ulm and, and, and Malcolm's the, the head strength coach there now and, you know, Megan Tomei's at Youngstown and, mm -hmm. and Bryden Falls up at uh, uh, Hillsdale and it's it just amazing. Just Zach Ball and it, there's just too many to name, but it's, it's an incredible program. I, I, I urge people who have uh, uh, children anywhere in the country in high school who are track athletes to go to that track camp because yeah. my son was immediately hooked. He's 14 years old and he wants to go to Ashland. You know, that's yeah. just the same kind of thing though. He hears those stories and you can't help but want to yeah. go. Yeah, I just had one of my uh, throwers because I help, I coach part time at the high school and she went to the Ashland camp and she came back and told me it was great. You know, she had a yeah. great time, learned a lot. So um, it's definitely. One of a kind. Did you take over the program from Blaine when he left? Or did you start coaching after he... Was he there coaching and then you... He, no, he wasn't there coaching. His dad was the coach there. Ah, uh, because that was another question Malcolm time, yeah. had. Is what would, uh, how was it taking over after after he left? But he didn't say it was the dad. He said he just mags. Yeah, so I, I didn't really take over. Because um, like I said, because I'm working full-time. Sure. Um, so I can... I don't make the practice nearly as often as I would like. So yeah. I can make it during the season two days a week and then, uh, you know, some meets have thrown the weekends. Um, so I'm just sort of come and go. It's not as much as I'd want, but I certainly didn't take over. But, I mean, I try to help out whenever I can. So. Yeah, that's super important. Yeah. Um, just getting that, um, that uh, I mean, you don't – Especially if you have someone else there helping you, you don't need to be there every single day. You give these kids whatever you can give them. I remember when I left, uh, I was coaching at this one school for 14 years, and my shift at work changed at the time. Yeah. I was working in a correctional facility, and I, I said, look, I, you know, I've got this assistant. I can be there three days a week now. And they just were like, oh, no, we need someone there five days a week. So I bounced over to Firelands where Zach Ball was mm -hmm. going into his senior year, and the coach was like, yeah, can you get Zach Ball to States? And I'm like, I think Zach Ball's going to States regardless, but yeah, I'll come over and coach <laughs> three times a week. And and uh, it was a great experience, and they just were grateful for whatever time you could give them, you know? Yeah. And, and I think, you know, those kids benefit from that, you know, they and they probably get excited when you show up and, you know, a little bit different style. And, 
Yeah, that's really cool. Um, did you throw post collegiately at all, or? Uh, no, no, just no. Nope. Yeah, I, th- I, uh, I thought there was a chance. Um, just be my senior year um, at Nationals in the Hammer didn't go as planned, and so like there was still like that. Yeah, like I had unfinished business sort of feel, and so when I went to chiropractic school, I thought you know maybe I'd still be able to sort of train and do a little bit there, but like my schedule there is just so overwhelming. Where did you go to there school? Life University in Georgia. Georgia, okay. Because yeah. you either it seems like you either go to Life University or you go to Palmer, right? That's like the two big ones. Yeah, yeah, those are probably definitely the two biggest. Yeah, yeah. My, my wife uh, grew up just down the street from Palmer. And, okay. Uh, um, Corey Lamar. I don't know if you know Corey. Do you know Corey yeah. Lamar? Yeah, he yeah. just he just uh, graduated through there, and now he's adjusting people. Um, are you in your own practice now, or do you work with somebody else? I am. So my wife's family is full of chiropractors. So okay. I work at her um, dad and sister, um, and her husband are all co-owners of the office. So there's four oh. of us out there, and so I'm I'm working out there. Full time, and I'm sort of starting to. Um, I'm trying to start my own. Okay, as well in Finley. Okay, so um, you. T- I'm. I'm. I'll first off say that I am a big fan of good chiropractors. Mm-hmm. I um, I was spoiled very early on. Uh, I remember the first time I went to see a chiropractor, I sneezed, and something went in my neck. Now. Yeah. <laughs> I know that all the damage I had done previously probably led to that that stupid injury, but right. um, I went in, uh, was hooked up with a guy. It was funny because I went to um, I went to the chiropractor and uh, he took to me immediately. He was an ex athlete and and he was just starting his own business at this time, and now he's got a health source, which is like a fleet of chiropractic places okay. up here. So um, he was a very good chiropractor. When he took over and started franchising out, he stopped adjusting people as much. Sure. And he was a, he was my lifesaver, kept me healthy. Um, so I came in, he said, I'm going to put you with this new chiropractor. The guy came in, big, giant, flabby guy. He looks like he'd never worked out in his life, adjusted me. I barely felt anything, uh, was telling me how weightlifting was killing me and how I needed to stop and was giving me weightlifting technique. And I was a professional Highland Games athlete at the time. You know, right. I was like, look, your job is just to put me back together. So he comes in and, and Chris says, you know, well, how did you like that? And I said, no, you got to get me away from this guy. You know, this isn't, uh, you know, he doesn't know what I'm, what, what I'm going through. He doesn't understand. And he goes, hold on a second. And he leaves, and five minutes later, this dude comes bouncing down the stairs, and he's like this surfer dude with this little <laughs> tiny goatee. He goes, oh, man, what's happening? And turns out he was an Olympic weightlifter. He was a, a former amateur Highland Games athlete. His name was Dr. Don Bassesi. And he adjusted me better than I'd ever been adjusted in my life, and he just became my go-to guy. Uh-huh, yeah. And he wasn't just into chiropractor chiropractic he was into everything holistic medicine and and sports injuries and all this stuff and i just got spoiled with these two guys and now i see a chiropractor now who's pretty good but i just don't get that same effect as he is now um what are your thoughts on the because some people will tell you oh this is just a scam it's just a it's an all-out scam (laughs) this doesn't work and these guys aren't qualified give you know i'm sure you've heard those things before What do you think about that? What do you what are, what are your thoughts when someone approaches you with that? Um, I mean, it's sort of one of those things where like the proof is in the pudding. I mean, it's it's hard to like from a scientific standpoint look at in, individuals. I mean, in general, as far as people, because everyone's background and demographic and everything is so complex and unique, you can't just apply one specific parameter to them and see well let's how let's see how this one thing affects all these different people because it's and so from a scientific standpoint it's hard to get like these big um these big studies looking at a, a large group of people and just applying the same you know chiropractic adjustment to them and you know from the same thing too like you said different chiropractors everyone everyone's going to jive better with a different chiropractor and that's i, I always tell patients this is the great thing about chiropractic or that's the good and bad thing about chiropractic is that you can go to 100 d- different chiropractors and get 99 different experiences. Yeah. 
but you're going to find one of those that suits you better, and then you can just stick with that person. Right. And so everyone needs, everyone has something different going on, and they need a, like a customized, you know, approach to what they have going on. And so, um, yeah. So I think that makes it difficult from a research standpoint, which is why some people think that's just a scam because well, there's not enough research backing, or they don't have any large group studies looking at chiropractic care for X Y Z condition. Um, I mean, there are a lot of studies with individual cases of chiropractic care um, with a a slew of different things, um, whether it be asthma, um, how it affects the function of the heart, um, bedwetting, colic, and kids, you know. Really? Yeah, but, and that's the thing, these are all just individual cases of people who came in to see a chiropractor, the chiropractor who actually documented well what they did so mm-hmm. they could sort of put that to pen and paper and, and see what exactly they did, how that correlates and connects with everything. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I can I can see why some people would think that it would be not a scam, but like the research. Um, Do you feel it's more it, artistic? It, it seems like there's an artistic level to it where there, yeah. you have to just be good at your well i mean you have yeah. to be good at your craft obviously yeah, yeah. And, and that's what um when i got into chiropractic school so when, when i started chiropractic school i sort of had a very narrow idea of what chiropractic was based on the chiropractor that i saw mm-hmm. who's, who's now my father-in-law who <laughs> um, was great um but then we get in there and so like we're taking actual philosophy courses as part of the chiropractic Oh, wow. curriculum, which yeah. is all chiropractic philosophy, and that's what they would say. Chiropractic is an art, philosophy, and science all sort of meshed together. And so there's, def- there's definitely different um, avenues that you can take as far as the way you want to treat people and how, you know, the best way that you see fit. Yeah. Um, and so it's, like I said, whenever you're dealing with with people in the body, everything is so complex. You, it's, you can't just nail it down, you know, to one cause and one effect. It's it's way more than what we can even... I mean, there, you know, five years from now, there's going to be more information that comes out that we don't have now that right. might explain theories that we have now, but we we just don't have the, the science there to actually give us the exact mechanism of why something is working. Yeah. You know, one of the things that... Um the, one of the the things that I see is if I go to a physical therapist and I get worked on... Mm-hmm. A lot of times they'll do the exact same thing that my chiropractor does for me, but there's no stigma attached to that. They're adjusting my neck just like my chiropractor does. They adjust my back just like the chiropractor does. I just don't understand why it's okay for for them and there's no stigma attached to that. When we're doing the same techniques, right. and, just, and I think it might go back to um, some of the other things the chiropractic, I mean, some people don't believe in acupuncture. Some people don't believe in dry needling or, right. or you know, uh, there's so many different things out there. But um, I don't know if you get into acupuncture at all, but uh, dry needling doesn't seem to work on me very well. Okay. But I have horrible seasonal allergies. Mm-hmm. I go to my chiropractor. He does. And now this is coming from a guy who's like, I know this isn't going to work. So there's no mental <laughs> stigma attached yeah. to this that I'm thinking it's going to work so it's all mental. I go in there, I get three treatments for my allergies, and all of a sudden in the worst part of my allergy season, I don't have the problems anymore. Mm-hmm. So You're saying treatments is in adjustments? Uh, acupuncture. He, okay, he puts okay. the needles all yep. over, and, and he does adjustments as well. Okay. Um, but you know, a lot of people will tell me it's all in my head. Well, I went in with the notion that this wasn't going to right, work yeah. and it did mm-hmm. um do you get into acupuncture at all do you do that i don't know a lot about acupuncture one of the doctors in the office does acupuncture mm-hmm. and so like if anyone ever comes in asking about it i was like you're just going to set something up with sure. him and talk i mean it's nice in that regard that we have someone there that we can refer to right i think that's why sometimes i tend to dabble in a lot of different things though is because you don't have someone to refer to so you have to go in and you know look Figure into it, it yourself out, yeah. yeah but yeah i I don't know a ton about it, so I can't. Yeah, I'll, but again, you know, relating it, I think it, 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 it's all, I, I don't think uh, that um, 
any of this is exclusive. It should all work together, right? I mean, yeah. Western medicine, Eastern medicine, chiropractic, acupuncture, all this stuff, it all works together. And it seems like there's some kind of divide there where people are constantly battling with each other just like everything else. Yeah, yeah. And I'm not sure what that really stems from. Because like you said, as far as physical therapists, a lot of what chiropractors and physical therapists do sort of overlaps. But again, it, it depends on who you see. Some physical yeah. therapists are going to be much more, um, I guess, old school physical therapy, where they're going to be more focused on just strengthening and rehab. Um, and then some chiropractors are going to be more just strict chiropractic and only doing the adjustments. Um, but yeah, I'm not sure where what it's created that tribalism thing. just like anything else yeah, right? I'm not sh- and i'm not sure if it's something where they're just trying to hold on to patients or people yeah um you know to keep them you know at their location but i mean it's it's got to be it's got to be you know a team effort and it's it's hard to uh it's hard to get that across sometimes right yeah It'd be nice to be able to go into a facility and have your primary care doctor there and a acu- or a acupuncturist and a chiropractor and have it all right. in one spot. You wouldn't have to search for people and you could have people that you know, you know, if you trust your chiropractor and they recommend a doctor, you know, that's usually the route I go anyhow. So yeah. I'll, I'll talk to my friends in the healthcare field that I'm already going to and say, hey, what about this guy? You know? Yeah. 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 And I... W- and I, I wish that people would seek out, I mean, not necessarily a chiropractor. I'm going to say a chiropractor because I'm a chiropractor. Um, a more, I guess, alternative or natural um, doctor before they go right to um, medical doctor or, you sure. know, a surgeon. Um, because it's, it's one of those, I think it was Rich Allen the first time I heard it, he said, um, when you're a hammer, everything's a nail. Yeah. And so if you go in, if you come in to see me as a chiropractor, I'm going to say, yeah, we can, we're going to adjust you. We can do this and we'll see, you know, I think I can help. Right. If you go into a surgeon, they will. Surgeons like to cut. <laughs> yeah. But and I, yeah, I have trouble saying that because I have had some patients come in and they and they say, you know, I've gone to my surgeon. They say, try this first, try that first. Mm-hmm. This should be a last resort. Yeah, and I think right, it should be because right, that's yeah, a very absolutely. invasive and aggressive step towards something. Um, but that's not always the case. And so, like, if you go and see a surgeon, and they want to do surgery. You know, failed back surgery is not an uncommon thing by yeah. any means. Yeah. And so you tried that; it didn't work. Now you've you know, if you've got a huge incision in your back, you might have some rods and pins, or you're just in more pain than when you started, and you're Absolutely. out how much money. Whereas if you come to see me or a more natural-minded person who generally our fees are going to be much less, if you come to see us, it doesn't work. Chances are you're not going to be worse off than when you started. Yeah. Because it's, from what a lot of people want to think, it's chiropractic care is very safe if you do it correctly. Yeah. Um, and then, I mean... If you come to see us as a new patient and you come for four visits, you're going to be out like 150 bucks. Yeah. You know, right. yeah. Versus thousands. So I just think from a standpoint of being, you can always add more, but it, I think it's, it's a very safe route to, to, to start sort of sure. entry level. And, and like you said, if, if you go to and see a chiropractor or any other doctor and they see a problem, and, that they don't think that they can help, then they can refer you. Out yeah, there. and why wouldn't you start at the the least invasive yeah. option and then move your way up? You know, instead yeah. of going right for the surgery. I've got a buddy, uh, same age as as I am. Uh, went to high school together. Had a uh, herniated disc in high school. Uh, has had probably four or five fusions since then and they just keep fusing up and up yeah, and up yeah, yeah. the spine and you know he he uh he is in a lot of pain still and uh it just seems to move up his back which i think that's what's happening and yep. um he sent me a message the other day as he saw you know that i'd been doing jujitsu and he said hey i was thinking about getting into jujitsu what do you think and i was like i, I don't <sighs> think so buddy i you know i yeah you know my back is super healthy but 
you still get torqued up and twisted, and that's right. the whole point of the whole sport. I don't think it's right yeah, for you. Not a, but, yeah, not a great fit there. Yeah. Uh, yeah, but, I mean, f- fusions can be, because, I mean, once you fuse just two segments together, let's say you do it in the neck. Yeah. And you move your head, that motion needs to sort of be evenly, evenly distributed between all those segments. You fuse two of them, those aren't moving. That slack is going to be picked up by the joints above and below that fused sure, section. Right. And so over time, it's going to wear those down. So that's why you see the fusion creeping up and down the spine from the original fusion is because yeah. those joints immediately surrounding that are getting more and more stress than what they normally would, and so it's wearing them out faster. Yeah, and they weren't built for that, obviously. The, yeah. Yeah, I, I, I try to... Um, the number one thing I get when people walk the door, and I always they sign the waiver to come here and lift and and i say what's wrong with you knees ankles hips back neck what you know what's wrong with you and you know everyone always has some kind of oh i hurt my back so and so and if you you look at them nine times out of ten you know they kind of got the pudding belly you know they're very inactive and you know i'm i'm guessing you know you're the expert but the the uh the muscles of the stomach aren't supporting anything they're probably have a sedentary job where their yeah. abs aren't supporting that back and they're just using their spine all day to to support or um it just seems to be like a uh an epidemic of people whether they yeah. actually have back pain or if they're just weak you know it's it's the number one problem i see when they walk the door yeah yeah i mean and it's tough because i mean so many jobs now are sedentary yeah um and yeah, I mean, if you're sitting down, chances are you're not sitting with a very correct posture. And so you are going to sort of get that rounding of the low back and yeah. the shoulders are going to come forward and everything like that. Um, that can lead to like an upper cross syndrome, um, shortening of the muscles that are going to sort of hold you in that posture. But at the same time, too, um, even if you are active, you know, if you sit down all day, though, you know, eight hours a day and you sit down in the car ride home and, if you know, working out one hour a day, a couple sure. days a week, yeah. isn't going to be enough to offset that. Um, and so it, it's, I mean, but I, I've definitely noticed, you know, if I have, if I'm working on someone who is um, an athlete, you know, it, I'm needing to adjust a lot less than someone, like you said, who is sedentary and, and uh, maybe not getting as much movement or exercise as what they probably what you, should. What do you suggest for people who have that sedentary job or maybe they're truck drivers, maybe they're secretaries, you know, they're just sitting all day. Yeah. Um, don't. Yeah. (laughs) But yeah, I mean, that's, I mean, it's not really like an actual, you know, like a feasible option. So, I mean, it's getting to some sort of a routine where you're at least getting some sort of movement. Um, and it doesn't have to be like real intense exercise, but I mean, some sort of a, and I, I've been getting a lot more into, I've been getting away from more like traditional lifting and exercising myself. Um, and that's sort of just, that was a, a journey of self-healing. It was like for selfish reasons because I was having sure. issues with my knee. And so I got into um, functional patterns. And have you heard of functional patterns? No, no. no. Okay. Um, that is... The guy who, um, I guess, in in charge, who founded it and all that, he's a very controversial personality in his videos, which I think has gotten better over time. Um, but it was one of those things where it was sort of put me off to it, but I kept looking at the content and seeing it and trying to apply it as best as I could because got, they've got a ton of videos on YouTube. Um, I'm going to pull it up while you're talking about yeah. it. Yeah. And so I, I was doing that, and, and I, I felt like I was... I was getting better, but I also really enjoyed the concepts that he was getting at and trying to apply. And it was it was a full like a connection head to toe of the body. Because so many times when we train, we train in just individual, you know, isolated muscle movements, and so we start to lose um, a lot of these integrated full body movements. And he really gets into um, using the um, anterior slings, posterior slings. Um, yeah, we're looking at it right now. Yeah. Um, but one of the things that really caught my attention, too, is he talks about 
how like holding a posture and being able to activate your transverse abdominis and your mm-hmm. lats and everything to hold you up and to what he said was decompressing your spine. He said, he said we're, we're in a constant battle with gravity and that's true. Sure. And so like when you have someone who's stands up and they've, they've got their hips really far forward and their shoulders are rounded, they've got that super kyphotic curve, like they are losing that battle against gravity. You know, it's just compressing them down so much. And that's, um, has a lot of different, um, effects. But I mean, just from like a chiropractic standpoint, posturally, that's not, that's going to put a lot of stress on different joints in the spine. Um, does the psoas start to tighten up too and pull oh yeah. you down even more? Yeah. Yeah. The psoas, that's something I see a lot yeah. in the office is the psoas. And I think it's, I think it's a lot of things that people Jesus don't. Christ, do you do this? No, no, <laughs> <laughs> no. Um, I do not do that. <laughs> it's like this guy's standing on a Swiss ball, swinging a medicine ball. It's camera. funny that you picked this up because I feel like this, this uh, of all the videos on here, he, he's caught a lot of crap about um, basically people trying to kill break it, break, break it down and say that oh he just does uneven surface training or he just stands on medicine balls right. and and does stuff but um he's actually um they've created a couple different um different exercise um machines that i think like their pulley system i think is is really cool i'd love to use one but um but i i just think and a lot of their training is just based on um just like gait, like they look at gait and break down the movements that just make a normal gait, and they a lot of their exercises are based off of that. And again, that is just a, a combination of connecting your anterior and posterior slings, you know, sure. cross crawl right. movement. And that's a thing that a lot of people uh, lack now, just because they lose that that integration. Just watch it, and 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 I've started recently uh, running, and and when I say long distance running maybe a 5k you know that's that's long to me yeah (laughs) but uh one of the things i really have to focus on is things like gait and foot placement and i have to like i have to consciously think about it or else i'll get pain you know i i i I try to get away from the heel striking and and uh the the rotation in my waist when i run and and if I don't think about it, or if I don't wear the proper shoes, Jesus Christ, you know, I'll be messed up for a couple of days. But yeah, um, it almost becomes like a meditative state where I'm just for, you know, 25 minutes, I'm thinking about yeah. trying to be perfect and not, not hurting myself. This stuff's amazing. This, I mean, I yeah, can see why that's he's, the, he's that's the cool fighters. machines. Yeah, yeah, and it's, it's a full body. So, I mean... And so, like, when I would do it, I would use um, a pulley machine, the gym that I was working at, um, and I would do just, like, single-arm cable presses. Yeah. And so, like, if I were doing that, like, when I was back in Ashland and just thinking about think I was just working the pack, you know, I would be able to put a decent amount of weight on there and move it, you know, pretty easily. Right. When I'm doing it with this methodology and, like, thinking and integrating the entire body and thinking about, like, firing the glutes when you're yeah, doing a yeah. cable press... You know, I was doing 25, 30 pounds for like 10, 12 reps, and I was gassed at the end of it. Right. It's a full body thing. It's not just working one muscle in isolation. That's easy to do. But right. when it comes to real life, if we're training our bodies to work in isolation and we need a full body movement, that's when injuries happen. I talk about this a lot. I did a video about it um, a couple of weeks ago for my military police and fire people. And, uh, when you're working in a job like that, and I was a corrections officer for 19 years, mm-hmm. it, it, you get into altercations or you get into high stress situations. The fact that you can bench 300 pounds becomes almost irrelevant. Yeah, there's a relative strength that comes with that, but yeah, you need to be able to like connect all that together. Right. You know, like I always think. So, um, has Kurt Roberts been on here? Yes. Yeah. Okay. And I'm trying to get one for a second time, yeah. but we can't get our schedules to come together. He's like one of those guys I feel like, I mean, he's obviously always been strong, but yeah. he was like that full body, just like arm strength strong. Yeah. You know? Yep. So like, and even, it's like when I was in high school and, you know, playing sports against other guys, whether it be basketball, football, whatever, you'd always run into these guys who like, they didn't look real strong until you bodied them up. And you're like, man, 
You yeah. know, I was not expecting that. And I think those are guys that are like full body connected. Yes. Versus just like you said, if they can bench three hundred pounds but they can't do anything with it, then you know, in real life that's not real applicable. First time I went into a jiu jitsu class and was working with uh Ulrich, who's the black belt there, hundred and sixty five pounds mm -hmm. and uh he got a hold of me and it, it the grip and the and the <laughs> fact that you can't move him and he's he does yoga and he does jujitsu. Yeah. You know, so I'm in there and at the time uh I weighed probably two fifty eight and was lifting some major weight and thought I was super strong and went in there. And this guy got a hold of me and it was like, I can't do anything to this guy. And yeah. it's because his whole life has been spent in positions and moving people who don't want to be moved and right. having to use every part of his body. And um, I think that's the same thing with those farm strong guys. You know, they learn from a very early age how to use their entire body. Yeah. I think that's the same with women. So when women come into the gym, it's much easier for me to get them stronger and teach them proper lifting mechanics because their whole life they've had to use their legs to lift things and tighten sure. up to yeah. lift things where us guys just, you know, rip it off the ground. And, right. You know, it's, uh, it makes life a lot easier when the women come in. But, um, but yeah, that stuff, that's, that's pretty amazing. I'll have to look more into that. It's called Functional Patterns on, on YouTube. Um, yeah. Like it's, his, some of his videos are very controversial as far as, like, his personality. He just comes up doesn't come across um great sort of aggressive sure um but i think a lot of it too is because he from what he was saying on there a lot of it he's been challenged and sort of beaten down on sort of taking this different stance and saying i mean he would come out and flat out say you know like traditional back squats like you should never do it because yeah. it's, it's, it's it's applying such compressive forces to the spine and so obviously i'd get a lot of backlash sure. from a lot of the people in the fitness industry yeah um, so um but yeah it's it's definitely interesting like i said i sort of sought it out as sort of a, a selfish motive because I was having some issues with my knee. I said, and it, I, I really think it helped. You know, I did enough where I, I would love to be able to integrate something like that into my practice. Um, but I, I mean, I flew out to California and did like the level one training with them and everything. And, um, it, and like it was a three day um, course or seminar. And like literally all we did was we just focused on a specific movement pattern for a press a row, a lunge, and like a transverse twist. Uh -huh. And that was like four days of those wow. basic movements, but they're all specific muscle firing patterns that like you wouldn't think, but they've, you know, slow-mo analyzed people like uh, Usain Bolt, uh, Barry Sanders, people with these phenomenal gates and athletic abilities, yeah, and they've broken right? those down to find the commonalities there. So um, I think there's a lot to it, but I think it, Again, sort of like chiropractic, it gets a lot of crap. I think people need to understand what what this this guy is not training to throw a discus two hundred feet. No, you yeah, know? and he'll say he's he's training for longevity yes. and to be able to move through his environment and just to feel well and be healthy. Yeah, right. Yeah, the, and and it, Robert Oberst did, uh, was on Joe Rogan a couple weeks ago and made the comment that uh, you know there's no reason to deadlift heavy unless you're yeah. Competing yeah. in that. And people flip their shit. And I'm like, It's true. What, what are you doing? Why? I mean, I, I deadlift heavy because I like to deadlift heavy. Sure, yeah. It, it, there's nothing about it that's probably healthy now. I mean, as I was coming up and I was deadlifting lighter and I was strengthening my back, but yeah. trying to pull 600 pounds now is, what am I doing? You know, it it isn't healthy. I know it isn't healthy, but, you know, yeah. <laughs> I'm probably better off deadlifting 400 pounds for reps and, and that I know I'm not going to injure myself doing, you know. Right. It makes sense. I get it. And it, it, people just flip out over the smallest little transgression yeah. by someone, you know. Yeah. Anything that challenges their beliefs or I mean, even the system that they had, you know, maybe like bought into and been, yeah. you know, using for years. If someone comes out and says, well, you know. That's wrong, and you've basically been doing it wrong for so much time. I mean, people are going to get upset. I, I put it. We do. That. We put out a training program, uh, and I don't call it online coaching because it isn't. I put out training templates every week, and people jump on it, and they can pick the ones they want to do. But for my strong man, uh, I add in like two conditioning workouts a week mm -hmm. because I don't think they need to be fat. You know, you, you yeah. have weight classes in this country. You can be whatever weight you want, and. Uh, some people, when they start on the program, get turned off to that really quick. And I'm like, 
you, you have to be a little bit more open minded. You have to take care of your fitness and your health because without that, it, you're never going to get to those high reaching goals you want right. because you're going to break down. You know, so I try to keep them moving more and and keeping their heart healthy as much as possible, and you know. Encouraging him not to eat like an asshole and stuff right. like that. Well, yeah, I'd listen to that podcast too. I mean, even he was saying on there, like, you have to work like the fitness cardio aspect of yeah. it. Because, like, yeah, you can you can pick up, you know, a 300 pound stone or whatever, but now you need to be able to carry that for, you know, X amount of distance. Yes. And you don't, if you don't think that's going to be car- cardiovascularly taxing, you're, yeah, <laughs> you're, you're mistaken. Yeah. And you, and I, I see that a lot when I, I, I did a very short stint in Strong Man probably three years, three or four years. And uh, I remember being in a contest one time and they changed it at the last minute. It was supposed to be a sandbag load to a platform. They couldn't get the platforms in the building. So it became a sandbag lift and carry for, I think, 60 feet. And these people were flipping their legs. And I'm just sitting there laughing like, it's 60 feet. (laughs) You can't carry this bag for 60 feet. Um but my training has changed so much. Uh, I'm down to 211 pounds now, um, and not really trying to lose weight. I'm just trying to be a better mover within my sphere of things that I do. So yeah. I still do strongman. Um, I still train strongman. I still squat. I still deadlift. I do a lot of metcons. I row. I run. I swim. I do kettlebells. I try to move in different planes and and. Um, I've never felt better in my life at 45 years old, yeah, you know, and, awesome. and things don't hurt as bad. And, um, I realized that, uh, being 260 pounds wasn't just not helping me in jujitsu. It wasn't helping me in life. In general. Yeah. It's amazing how much uh, dropping 50 pounds will help. Right. I did the same thing when I, so when I was at Ashland, I, my heaviest, I was just a hair under 250, I think. And you're how tall? Six, three, six, four. Okay. Um, and then the summer before my senior year, um, I dropped 20 pounds over the summer, came back in around 225-ish, yeah. somewhere around there. And, like, my lifting numbers um, went down a little bit, mm-hmm. but I was actually able to, like, I was more dynamic. And so, like, for the throws, yeah. it helped out way more. I had a way better season, and I just felt better, you know? Like, yeah. when I was that big before, you know, I'd, like, come home during the summer or whatever and, like, try to play, like, pickup basketball yeah. with my friends, and my knees would just kill afterwards because, yeah. you know, 240 pounds running up and down the the court and it's just but yeah i mean i feel great now i tell people when i when i was throwing in the highland games uh i had gotten up to 312 pounds and uh you know i made nationals five times uh, I, I did all these cool things but i think if i would have been 265 pounds i wouldn't have you know if i wouldn't have had this thing in my head that mass moves mass and i had to be huge yeah i think if i would have been at 265 and Maybe my lifts, w- my, maybe my deadlift would have been six seventy five instead of seven thirty. But who the fuck cares? I'm only throwing a twenty eight pound weight. You know, I mean, I would have been much more dynamic and healthy and fluid. And yeah, that's that's why I, I was sort of the same thing. I mean, that's why I was trying to like pack on all this weight yeah. when I was there. You know, because you want to throw further, be stronger. You have to, you know, be bigger and weigh more. But at the same time, I mean, there's a there's a ratio you have to stay with. Yes. you know, if you're if you weigh so much, but you don't have the strength to move that weight dynamically, I mean, especially for the throws. I yeah. Mean, the entire throw takes place in like two, three seconds, right. you know? And so there's a lot of mass to move that quickly and dynamically. So there's, I learned that the hard way. <laughs> yeah, we all learn it at later stages. I'm a big believer when we work with athletes now, uh, my son's a thrower. Um, he does conditioning workouts with us. But yeah. what I like about it is he's lifting Atlas stones. He's slinging kettlebells. He's doing push-ups. He's doing pull-ups. He can do all these athletic movements. And if you've ever tried to lift an atlas stone from the ground your shoulder, it it's all the same benefits as the cleaner snatch. Mm-hmm. You're getting that huge hip extension. You have to be explosive from your waist. And to get it all the way up there, it, it, but it's also an odd object. It's not perfectly balanced and weighted, which yeah. we're going to find when we throw, you know? Yeah. I, I'm a big believer in that stuff. It also teaches these kids a little bit of mental toughness and yeah. <laughs> they, they all need. But um, Let's talk a little bit about the holistic side of of your interests, let's say, and okay. how you got into that. All right. Um, Obviously, chiropractic I, being the holistic yeah. as you can get. Yeah, yeah. 
And uh, and I've thought about this before, and I'm not really sure what exactly. Like I know what piqued my interest in chiropractic was I started out as a patient, and I just I saw the way um, that my chiropractor father-in-law was practicing, and it, it interested me. And mm-hmm. he did a lot with um, adjusting, but also like the manual muscle testing. If you're familiar with yeah, that, yeah, I've had that done. Yeah, yeah, and that, that's really intrigued me. And so I always sort of had that in the back of my mind as like a profession. But then I went to Ashland, I studied exercise science and nutrition. And I think um, while I was there, um, the I really got into the nutrition aspect of things. Um, they had a, a, a great, he's still there, a great um, yeah, I professor to his, there. What's his name? Do you know but, it? Uh, Venata? Yeah, I listened yeah. to a seminar with him last, uh, in December. Yeah. Um, and I think that's what really piqued my interest in nutrition. Because, I mean, before that, as far as, like, my diet, I mean, it was pretty yeah. average yeah. Uh, at best. That's College why, kid. That's why I say generous. Yeah. yeah. Um, and he, he really got me interested in the nutrition side of things. I think it was just, like, the way that he taught um, it was very dynamic, and it sort of engaged you. Mm-hmm. And I think it also just, I don't know, I was just drawn to it, too. Mm-hmm. So, like, those two together really, really, uh, really got me going in that direction. Um, and then my wife, who I was dating at the time, she um, switched her diet to gluten-free mm-hmm. for health reasons. Um, and so then I did that as well, so I adapted that. Um, and that, when you're, when you're gluten-free, and that was like eight, ten years ago, it's much easier to eat gluten-free now. Yeah, um, yeah. <laughs> and back, but then it was a little bit tougher, and so you, um, I th- and that's what got me into, like, actually having, like, cook things. Mm-hmm. And so I, I really enjoy cooking now. Um, like, all these things just sort of were just, like, more natural-minded, holistic. Um, yeah, I don't. Like yeah, like I said, my like built on each other. Yeah, it was. I, I wouldn't have uh, foreseen this as my path, you know. Right. When I was in high school, and I know a lot of my friends joke now. They're like, "Who would have guessed out of all of us uh, that Corey would have been the doctor?" <laughs> so, and I was like, "I yeah. agree with you, man." I was like, "I." <laughs> right. It took me by surprise too. Well, how do you? So, um, how do you eat now? Like, what are you? Uh, do you? Sp- do you follow any kind of specific diet, or is it just more healthy options? Um, I for a while I did the ketogenic. Um, Good, that was great. I want to talk to you about that. Yeah, um, and then I started to. So now I I try to stay more seasonal okay. with yes, the I foods. Um, and so, like at first when I started with the ketogenic, I just wanted to like do it year round. Um, and then I was, I think it was, um, it was, I forget which season it was. I think I was in, I think it was like during the summer and I was like, just, I tried to like load up on like all these fast tries to ketosis. And I was checking my numbers, um, cause I was, I was monitoring my blood glucose and ketones and like, they just weren't adding up. I was like, you know, I'm doing all this right. Right. But I'm, I was having trouble staying in ketosis and so that's what, that's what sort of brought me down the rabbit hole of the different effects on light um, is because I was listening to a podcast with Dr. Pompa. Um, he's a chiropractor, and that's what got me into the ketogenic diet was mm-hmm. I did a seminar with him, and he had talked about that. And he had on uh, Dr. Jack Cruz. Okay. Um, and he, have you heard of? No. no. Okay. Um, so that's a rabbit hole I've been stuck down for like a couple of years now. That's driving my wife crazy, I think, but. <laughs> Um, so he was talking about the effects of, of light on food and the ketogenic diet. And so um, to keep it simple, in, during the summer, we've got longer light cycles. And so that's when carbohydrates are more naturally available. And so that's when I think we should cycle out of a ketogenic diet versus more in the winter time when the carbohydrates aren't naturally available. That's when we need to rely more on meat and fat mm-hmm. and fasting to sort of sustain us. Um, historically that's probably how we would have eaten yeah as, yeah na- as yeah cavemen. naturally that's yeah and that's um and that's why i never did the paleo diet um even though a lot of these are just low carb high fat for the most sure. part but um paleo to me is don't eat like an asshole you know yeah eat vegetables and fruits and, and yeah. a little bit of fruit and meat and nuts and yeah, yeah. but after listening to this podcast with dr pompa and dr cruz um you know he was saying just because you can eat a banana in December doesn't mean 
biologically you should because mm-hmm. that creates essentially confusion within the body because your eyes are and your body's picking up one thing in the environment but you're eating a food that came from the other side of the world right um and so that's there's i always say there's nothing paleo about eating you know strawberries or banana in december or right you know so. i just had that um introduced me adrian smith who um adrian if you're listening i still owe you money so send me a bill <laughs> um Adrian uh, is uh, a Paula Quinn doctor, or Paula Quinn coach, I guess you would sure. say. But uh, she was the first one who brought that up to me, and it, it made total sense yeah. when she was talking to me about it. Um, I had major, and people have heard me talk about this in the podcast before, I had major uh, blood sugar issues, um, I think pretty much all my life. I can remember being like 12, 13 years old and mowing the lawn and getting really like, like time slowing down and that yeah. kind of stuff, and I would have yeah. to go in and eat a whole yeah. bunch, um, and just that was always how I lived. And then we were in Nova Scotia uh, for a Highland Games. Um, this is the last time I had a voluntary carbohydrate. So I was in Nova Scotia in 2012, um, was starving, ate a big uh, Subway sandwich with all that bread. Uh, we went back to the hotel room, took a shower. My wife took a shower. When she came out, I was passed out on the bed. Because my blood sugar had just dropped to nothing. Yeah. And uh, we talked about it. And uh, I just decided that I was going to... Didn't know what keto was. I just right. said, I'm going to cut out all sugars and carbohydrates from my body altogether. And then I you know, started looking into it more. And Atkins turned into keto. And so I've basically been on some kind of low-carb to no-carb keto sure. diet since 2012. Um, for me... And I, I, I'm not a, obviously I'm not a doctor, so I don't recommend shit to anybody. I said, this is what worked for me. Right. Um, after that, I dropped, uh, you know, probably 80 pounds in a year. Um, my lifts were all fine. I never had the keto flu. I never, um, you know, my training was fine. Nothing changed. I just felt so much better. And I just think that that's the way my body um, was meant to be. Now, since January, I've gone to a more carnivore style diet and I feel even better. Um, I've lost, I went from uh, 258 uh, down to 211 since January. Uh, My mental clarity seems to be even better. I'm able to run and swim and do all this shit now. Um, But again, I don't recommend it to people because I don't understand it. And I'm certainly not going to say, oh, it's for you. That's the way you should eat, you know? Yeah. it's been great. I, I, it's been a life changer for me. But uh, it's, um, I think what I'm looking into more now is is gut health, and, and I want to start adding in more things like kimchi and sauerkraut. And yeah. What's your thoughts on that? Um, again, I think that can be seasonal, mm-hmm. um, but I think, I mean, there are definite benefits to it. I mean, I feel like there's more and more information coming out every day about um, how the gut bacteria can affect our overall health. And, you know, it started out as, well, they're just good gut bacteria, and that's better than having bad gut bacteria. Sure. You know, and, and so now the more they've looked into it, you know, it's tied to our immune system and, you know, all these other things. And so it's, um, I mean, I think it's definitely beneficial. I mean, especially if, especially if you were, you know, were sick or whatever, and you went to your doctor, and they prescribed you, you know, a ten day thing of antibiotics, whatever. Yeah. You need to, you need to re re inoculate uh, the the gut with that bacteria. Yeah, I ch- I'm just trying to tweak things as I go, and if this yeah. makes me feel great, I do it. If it doesn't, I I discard it. Um, one of the things we were we were talking about before the show is um, I went in to have my cholesterol checked. My cholesterol has traditionally been high. Father has high cholesterol. Um, last time I was in, it was uh, just under 300, but had been on the carnivore diet for several months. Um, everything else felt fantastic, though. And mm-hmm. uh, they immediately put me on a statin drug. A lot of the side effects, they tell you about statin drugs, I went through immediately. Yeah. Muscle wasting, lo- muscle loss, torn hamstring muscles, where I've never had problems with that before. Um, so... What are, do you have thoughts? I know you've posted a couple of things about statins and yep. when they should be used, if they should be used, and and that kind of stuff. Um, I just personally, I'll never take a statin. Okay, um, why? It's I threw mine out. 
<laughs> yeah. Um, well, I, I, cholesterol, the fact that it still gets like a bad rep for like clogging arteries, and it, it's such old, like antiquated, I don't even call it knowledge, theories mm-hmm. that have been disproven by now. Um, I was actually, I knew you were going to talk to me about this, so I was, I was sort of listening to some other stuff to get Good. caught back up on it a little bit. Um, I actually learned a couple new things too. Um, but yeah, it's, I mean, cholesterol is vitally important for everything in our body. You know, it literally makes up every cell, it's part of every cell membrane, it's part of the myelin sheath, the wrap that goes around Mm -hmm. all your nerves. Um, it's an essential part to make, um, different, uh, sex hormones, steroids, all that sort of, so, I mean, it's, you can't just taking a drug to try to lower all that's going to affect all those things. Sure. You know? Um, and, and even the, some of the research that has come out saying that, you know, statins taking the reduced heart attack by 50%, a lot of those numbers are just, they're cooked, you know? So, the, and this is something I, it's been a while since I've looked into the specifics of this. Um, but it's, they basically, they'll, so if they take two groups Let's say it's 100 people in each group. They'll give one statin and another not. And then they'll take a look and see how many heart attacks occurred within those two groups. Um, and if one group had one person that had a heart attack, and that was the statin group, and then the other group had two people that had a heart attack. So one out of 100 and two out of 100. Right. Not st- statistically significant sure. by any means, but they'll look at that and they'll say, well, the group that didn't have statins had twice as many heart attacks. Yeah. And so they'll publish that data and say, this the study found that there's a 50 percent reduction in you know heart attacks with people who take a statin yeah and that's i mean that's not anyone who looks at that study would go that's bullshit yeah um and so just the fact that the research i think is is very flawed um there's always information coming out about the importance of cholesterol and how it's different roles in the body um and i think it's i think a lot of it's just getting a bad rap because when it started, they were looking at, um, they would take these plaques out of um, the arteries mm-hmm. of people who had passed away from a, a heart attack, um, and they would analyze it and, you know, find that there was some cholesterol in there. they say, well, cholesterol did it, you know, yeah, yeah. case closed, avoid cholesterol. Um, and that's what I, what I was listening to yesterday. It was a... Bart K is his name. I've um, heard of him. Yeah. Um, and like he was saying, he's like, they've actually taken those out now, those plaques, and put them on a microscope and analyzed, and the amount of actual cholesterol and um, other fats in there are absolutely negligible. It's right. like 0.05% of that clot is made up of cholesterol. or whatever. It's mainly a fibrous tissue, um, and the cholesterol, or the cholesterol, the fat that was in there, that had the highest amount of fat within that plaque was actually um, these mono and polyunsaturated fats, which are like the canola oils and all these oils. Margarine. Yeah, these things that they'll tell you are heart healthy, but um, anything the American Heart Association says, just do the opposite. Right. It's, well, how many it's, things have we, we, we had over the years, you know? Sugar was safe, but salt will kill you. You yeah. know, fat is bad, but, but uh, you know, eat margarine instead of butter. It, it it just seems like, and then to try to talk to someone my parents' age about this. Like, I yeah. go to a restaurant, and I just put salt on my food because, you know, I know that that's a beneficial thing I need in my diet. Yeah. And they start freaking out. And I'm just like, how do you how do you re-educate someone in their 70s who's been told their entire goddamn life to do the wrong thing for their health? Yeah, it's, it's, it's definitely tough. But, yeah, I mean, like you said, I mean, it's just been like, how they were brought up to yeah. to think these things, and it's Cheerios decreases cholesterol and makes you heart healthy. You know. <laughs> yeah, I had a a patient. She, um, again, she was. I think she was in her eighties, um, and she was saying like she was having issues with her blood sugar. I think it was, and she was saying, "I don't understand." She's like, "I have, you know, I wake up, I have a healthy breakfast every morning." She's yeah. like, "I have." A bowl of cereal and a glass of orange juice. Oh yeah, I like, wonder. Yeah, it's a sugar overload. It's nothing but sugar there, you know. But I mean, in so many people's minds, that's a healthy yeah. breakfast, and it's 
Well, I haven't That's had crazy. any blood, blood sugar issues since then. You know, since yeah. I, I cut out carbohydrates and sugar in my diet, and uh, I haven't had a problem since. So here's an holistic approach. Here was the bottom line thing I could have done before I went to a doctor and, yeah. and got on some medicine was I just changed my diet, you know, and, and it worked. Yeah, and uh, yeah, and I think the sad part about that is I think it's it's hard to I want to say enforce a diet change, but convince people to make a change in their lifestyle. Because yeah. one, it's I know a lot of people are just so busy; it's hard to incorporate yeah. and make that change. And then you know, just mentally, there are certain foods that you sort of fall back on and whatever. Um, but I think a lot of times when you go in to see a doctor for if they think you have high cholesterol or blood pressure, or whatever, they'll just like their first line of defense is just. Yeah, to just take this pill for the rest of your life. Yeah, and that's just putting band aids on real problems. And I mean, it's going to catch up with you down the road. When I looked at my blood work, everything was fantastic. Um, my blood pressure was was low. And it's the first time it's been. I mean, it's never been super high, but sure. it's the first time it's actually been low in a ever. Um, my triglycerides were low. Everything was good. My cholesterol was the only marker that was high, and it was immediate. Mm-hmm. We need to put you on a statin. Um, I talked to, uh, do you know Ryan Fanley? He's, uh, uh, he's down in so. Cincinnati. Brilliant guy. Um, but he was like, well, did they do any, you know, checks for particle size or anything like that? And I said, no. And he said the same thing you did, that this is, you know, it's just the, the Band-Aid they throw at everybody when they walk through yeah. the door. And, I mean, what you said, I think the most important, if your blood pressure is down, I think that immediately decreases your risk of a heart attack. Sure. Um, so I was listening to that. Um, talk with uh, Bart. He was he sort of pointed out, and I never really thought of it. Um, but the the placking, whatever, for heart attack that only occurs in the arteries, not the veins. Mm-hmm. Um, that's because the arteries are the high pressure side of of the uh, of the cardiovascular system because that's where yeah. the, pump, the heart is pumping out. And once you reach the veins, it's just muscular contractions and the valves within the veins that keep the heart or the blood flowing back to the heart. And so if one, lowering your blood pressure is going to help decrease some of that stress on the arterial walls, um, but then what also will lead to those arterial walls to be damaged, which what's which is what creates the the placking. Yeah. So the body's trying to basically sort of heal that up and put, I guess you can think of it as like a scab over that. Sure, um, that makes sense. It's just like an inflammatory lifestyle or so diet. So, I mean, um, and again, that's where the carbohydrates come in. Yeah. The omega-6 fatty acids, things like that, those are all going to be very pro-inflammatory. You mix that with high blood pressure, that's going to lead to damaged arterial walls, and then that's when the, the placking and, well, I guess it's mainly, I guess when they looked at those plaques, it was mainly fibrous tissue uh-huh. that was, that was, uh, what, that made those up. So right. and that's where, that's where the issue is. It's not cholesterol. Cholesterol is part of, cholesterol is just, Guilty by association because sure. it's around the plaque, but uh, yeah, cholesterol and fat as being the demon. I think that needs to be that should have been taken out of this, the conversation a long time ago. But yeah. it's it's hard to like he's people who have grown up with that information. It's hard to change their mind, but also at the same time, I mean, what the schools are teaching. It's by the time the data gets in there, it's been twenty plus years since sure. that since that data has actually been uncovered by the time it goes through these peer reviewed process and actually put into a new book and even if they put into a new book, how often are the schools using right. brand new textbooks? I don't you know? think a lot of these doctors get very much nutritional information. They're you know, it's Yeah, and they the, get short courses on it. But yeah, I know from depth. like a, a medical doctor or any other program obviously that I have not been through, I can't really say. I know at chiropractic we had the chiropractic school we had um, I think a solid year at least yeah. of nutrition. And you're actively continuing to educate yourself, whereas... Yeah, and that's another thing. Like, there's so much information that comes out. Like, yeah. you have to constantly be pursuing it to stay up to date. Um, otherwise, I mean, you're just spewing out... Garbage. In, yeah, information that's not entirely accurate anymore. We get guys in here all the time, my age, a little bit older... You know, and they're on blood pressure medications, and that's the first thing I tell them: we got to get you off. We got to get you healthy enough that we can get you off that blood pressure medication, because they're having all the other 
you know, they're, you know, they're they're goddamn impotent. They're, you know, they, they have all these problems. They can't get up and down off the ground to do the burpees because they're getting lightheaded. And, and mm -hmm. they'll come to me privately and say, you know, I mean, I haven't had a heart on and for so long. And it's like, Jesus Christ, we have to get you healthy enough that you can chase your wife around the house again, you know, and get you off these pills. But it just seems to me that again, if we go back to the basics and the yeah. the most uninvasive treatment possible first let's get that 40 extra pounds off your belly you know and yeah. and get you moving and get you healthy and and and, get, and we have had several people who've gone in and and either the doctor has taken them off or they said hey i haven't taken it and for so long and now my blood pressure is still low you know and kind yep. of surprised the doc with it and that's for me um nowadays that's for me is is rewarding as when i was working with young throwers and they went yeah. to states you know yeah I mean, that's awesome it, it's great um give me uh the rundown on um and I'm, I'm throwing these fucking topics at you like you know <laughs> um uh the light uh, okay. uh sunlight yeah. sunscreen the whole nine yards and and the other thing i was interested in is the phones uh the the, the blue light with the phones at night too. yeah okay so this is the hole that I've been, I've mm -hmm. been down in for several years, um, and like I said, it all started with n nutrition. Mm -hmm. And so it was a podcast with Dr. Jack Cruz, um, who you should look him up. He's got a ton of information on yeah. online for free. His podcast, he's got a bunch of podcasts on YouTube, not his podcast, but podcasts that he's been on, um, and those are packed with a ton of information. Um, and like I said, he's the one who sort of got me to look at food a little bit differently based on the light cycles. And so um, what that's, and he's been doing this, and he's, and he's, not, he's not like a, some crack pop, you know, who's, who's just making all this stuff up. He's a, he's a neurosurgeon. He still practices neurosurgery. Um, tip of the spear. He's tip of the spear. Yeah, I mean, yeah. yeah. And... And sort of the same thing. He started this journey for like a self, selfish reason, self healing. He was having issues. He, you know, he'll he'll tell you in almost every podcast you listen to. He was overweight. He tore his knee meniscus just standing up to give a speech. Yada yada. And so wow. he went down this. Yeah, he went down this journey. And so now he's he's all about. He'll say light, water, and magnetism all the way. And he said those are like the three basic. Again, back to the basics. The three basic foundations of life he said you know, if they look for life on mars you know they're looking for light water and magnetism okay for, like for other planets you know um and so so yeah i've been down this this uh this rabbit hole with light and how it affects our body and so essentially you've got a spectrum of electromagnetic frequencies and so visible light is within the spectrum that we can you know see mm -hmm. um but then you've got infrared far infrared you've got gamma rays on there all of these things are all electromagnetic frequencies but we have just humans ha have been under a very specific frequency for a very long time mm -hmm. and that is the sun the sun and just the earth's natural um magnetic frequency and then so within the last hundred years when we start really you know integrating technology and technology is booming that's when our bodies have been exposed to a very large variety of um what they'll say is non-native emf um electromagnetic frequencies and our bodies just don't know how to tolerate it you know because it's and he had put a uh he used an analogy on a facebook post and had basically broken it down to where every day of the year was like five or ten thousand years within human history. And he's like, if you live that entire year completely healthy, normal, and then a half hour before midnight, New Year's Eve, like everything went turned to crap and went to chaos, you know, what would you blame that on? Would you blame that on the one thing that you've been the sun that you've been living under this entire time right. or the introduction of this new thing, which would be technology and this massive influx of these different makes a lot magnetic of frequencies. Yeah. But, um, and again, there's a ton of information coming out on the effects of, so 
blue light, which is what you, you asked about with the computer screens, mm -hmm. um, cell phones, tablets, all that, um, LED lights, everything. Um, that is that will throw us out of what's called a circadian rhythm. Mm -hmm. So the sun changes naturally throughout the day. So first thing at sunrise, it's more the the spectrum will change. So it's more red and purple light. And then as the day goes on more towards noon, there's going to be more blue light. And then in the evening, it'll be more uh, red and orange light again, which is why you know the sunrise and sunset are going to be more. Um, and so our bodies need that change of light throughout the day mm -hmm. because they're finding out that that is, um, I mean, those are signaling frequencies that our, bot our cells pick up and that will, I mean, it basically runs our body sure. for the most part. And so, so like I said, at noon, at high noon, a lot of blue light naturally. Mm -hmm. Okay. So our computer screens, everything is blue light. So if you're laying down in bed at 11 o'clock at night, it's pitch black. You check your email. Again, it's a it's a mismatch between what your body what your body is picking up and what your eyes are telling your brain is going sure, on. Because yeah. your eyes are getting all this blue light and they're telling your brain, "Hey, it's it's noon," you know. And so that will, I mean, it can in, um, trouble sleeping. Obviously, yeah. that can disrupt. Um, and like you said, with um, with some of your clients who will come in who are unhealthy and they and they. Um, they have like an erectile dysfunction. I had a patient come in, um, and I didn't even tell them to do this. They did this on their own through their own research, but they was having troubles with erectile dysfunction. And so they did some research into light. And so they, all the lights at night that were in their bedroom, got them all out, everything completely. They got the curtains that completely block out light from uh -huh. the outside, even their alarm clock they got rid of and they replaced it with like an alarm clock that a blind person would use. So right. you just touch it and it would, you know, tell you what time it was. And they said within a matter of days, it was night and day. Wow. And it was just like a hormone reset because you don't have that interruption in yeah. the light cycle. Um, and so, again, this this topic is very complex. That's why I've been stuck down in this sure. rabbit hole trying yeah. to figure this, this stuff out. This is just a teaser for, for other people to check out more of it. Yeah, I would. Uh, if this intrigues you in the least, I would definitely check it out. Um, but then, so, yeah, but that... Red light therapy, which is, I mean, I'm sure you've probably seen stuff like with the juve light and all uh -huh. that stuff yeah. online. Yep. That's, red light is sort of the antidote for blue light. And so okay. that's why red light is a very healing frequency uh, or magnetic frequency for us. And so like blue light will only penetrate so many centimeters through our skin. Red light can actually penetrate all the way through our body, like up to 30 centimeters. So it's a very... It's a very healing light and it has a much greater effect on us um, as far as reaching cells in our bodies that are further under the under the surface. Um, so that's like it's, it's driving my wife crazy because when I first got into this, I was like, "All right, red light, red light therapy." I started looking into it a little bit, and I was like, "And you know, some of those panels, if you look at the juve, they're sort of pricey, you know, three, four hundred dollars sure. or more." And so I wanted to, like a cheap alternative to try to figure this out, and so I would go online. And I bought just like a, an infrared bulb for like a sauna. Sure. And so yeah. I would um, turn that on at night, you know, because that's, like I said, sort of like the counteraction to blue. Um, and that's just a good time of the day to, to have that on. Right. Um, and so my wife would always draw the curtains in the living room when I would have that on because she right. didn't want people driving by her house and seeing this red light lit up at night. Um, but it, it's something that, um, again, there's, ton of information about it out there um called a lot of people call it red light therapy it's also called photobiomodulation okay um and if you just like type that in i mean to like a like a PubMed or some sort of a, a research database i mean there's a ton of information on photobiomodulation um and again that's just the effect of different red light frequencies on on our health yeah and that's um that's part of what we use at a in our chiropractic office is we use it's also called low level laser therapy there's like six different names for it um but it's, but we use this low level laser therapy we can help people with food sensitivities outdoor sensitivities and huh. things like that and we're basically we're hitting them with specific frequencies of light and it would also use like the eastern medicine so we'll use different meridians and acupuncture points mm -hmm. um and these people and their sensitive food sensitivities, outdoor allergies, everything like that wow. is, is getting better. And so it's, I, it's, I, uh, 
when so people who here's our, our normal day i'm stuttering like an asshole um our normal day is the first thing that happens is we wake up in the morning we grab our phone and we check through all our emails and social media yeah and that same thing at night right before you go to bed you're yeah. fucking with yourself right there right yeah i mean yeah um and a lot of people think of melatonin as like the you know the it helps us to sleep right you know essentially and so we think we need that at night but actually our melatonin starts like the reset the recoup in the morning and so if you get that blue light hit like first thing in the morning that's going to disrupt your body's ability to create melatonin or recycle the melatonin wow. to use that and so yeah that's it's a bad habit that a lot of people are in first yeah. thing in the morning you look right at the phone um and then last thing a lot of people look at before they go to bed yeah. too is their cell phone or a tv i've gotten rid of mine at night uh as soon as my wife and kid get home, I figure, what else do I need? You know, they're fine. I put my phone away. Yep. I'm going to start doing it in the morning, too. Try to hold off looking at it as long as I it's, can. It's a hard habit to break. That's sure. my first. I, I didn't realize that I, I didn't realize that I did it, really, until I yeah. like, consciously thought about it. And now, I mean, a lot of times I don't look at my phone in the morning unless I need to look at it quick to see what time it is. But, right. I mean, any clock we have in the house now is digital anyway. So sure. they're all going to be a blue-lit backlight. But. At least you're um, not exposing yourself to long periods of it. You click, yeah. you look, and you yeah, and, yeah. I try to avoid, and even so, like all the lights at our office are LED lights, and so, and again, if you, uh, one way to sort of counteract or reduce the damage that you're doing is to buy a pair of blue blocking glasses. Okay. So I've got two pairs. I've got one pair that I wear at work. That's like a. It's just a very very slight tint. Uh huh. Because um, like I said, I'm working under LED lights all day. And then I've got a pair of like dark red or like amber glasses I'll wear in the evening. Your wife must love all this. I yeah. can imagine. Yeah. yeah. My wife's always she irritated with my yeah. rabbit holes too. <laughs> so I get I get it. Yeah. 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 She does well with it, but it's I'll still get an eye roll every once in a while. Oh yeah. When, yeah. when you get focused on shit like we do, I think it's irritating for those around you. Yeah. Like, can't you just be normal like, for one second? Yeah. And it it's crazy because because a lot of times, like, I'll jump down these little rabbit holes, and I'll sort of, I'll try to go down, mm -hmm. sort of, like, the big idea, mm -hmm. and then I'll get back out and move on to the next thing. Like, I've been stuck on this for, like, two or three years. I just can't, it, it's just so deep and complex, it just goes and goes and goes. Now, what's your thoughts on uh, sun exposure and sunscreen? Because yeah. I saw you post a couple things on that as well. Yeah. <laughs> it's funny, my, my younger brother actually just sent me, um, it was in a group chat with my family, a picture of him sunburnt. Right. And he, he said... Dr. Corey said sun, sunlight exposure is great. I'll be healthy and do that. And he's just looking miserable and sunburned. Yeah. And I was, I was like, yeah, it is, but you got to... Everything within reason, right? Yeah, it's like you can't, um, you can't avoid the sun all summer and then like you go on vacation, head right. to the beach and stay out there for, you know, even a half hour you're going to be right. burnt. It's, it's a tolerance sort of thing. But yeah, and again, sunlight throughout the day is important. Um, and I, just, I think I just posted recently about how, I mean, we need UV light to make vitamin D, mm -hmm. among other things. Um, and we know that as our vitamin D levels go up, our chances of any disease drastically go down. I and, supplement it, especially in the winter, I supplement it with yeah. vitamin D. Um, and so to say that vitamin, or to say that UV light will cause cancer, and again, it's something that we've been under for how many hundreds of thousands of years, and just now skin cancer is an right. issue is crazy. But again, that's like the dogmatic thought that UV light causes cancer, stay out of the sun, wear sunscreen, wear sunglasses. Um, and it, it's just, it's ridiculous. Yeah. I think I just posted, they, there was a study, it was within the last year or two, where they looked at, um, they took a group of people from the Navy. Um, and they looked and see the incidence of skin cancer uh, in the people who were exposed to different amounts of light based on, I'm assuming, their job or position there. And they found they had the higher, highest incidence of skin cancer in people who stayed inside the most. Right. And then the people who had, like, the intermittent exposure who were in and out throughout the day had the least amount. And so, again, it's, especially with UV, now UV is going to be highest, like, around noon or, like, around here. It's usually around, like, 1 o'clock. And so that's going to be the most chance to get like a sunburn um, so it's going to be the most stressful to the skin but again if you sort of like work up a tolerance to that i mean you, you can spend more and more time outside right. of the UV light without getting a sunburn so i'm not saying go out and get sunburned that that's healthy 
because it's not, because it damages the skin. But if you sort of work your way up and are outside throughout the day and not just at the highest UV time, you know, it, it's going to drastically improve your health. Yeah, when I was uh, competing in Highland Games, you know, Highland Games competition would sometimes last five, six, seven hours, and you were out in the sun the whole time. And I, I get super dark if I'm out in the sun for a long period of time. But as long as the first few exposures I had, so like maybe the first games of the year, I would put on sunscreen in the morning and mm -hmm. I would be fine. And then the rest of the season, I wouldn't wear it all year and I would never get sunburned. Um, and that seems to be like when I go on vacation. So if we go on vacation in February, I'll use it. But if yeah. I'm going to Key West on Friday, I won't. And I never have any problems with it. But, you know, I'm always one of these guys who have looked into it and it's like, well, you know, when we were kids, no one wore sunscreen and skin cancer, nobody even heard about it. And now yeah. all of a sudden everybody's got skin cancer, you know? Yeah. So is it from the sun or is it from people putting these weird chemicals on their bodies all the time, you know? Yeah. And, uh, and again, sort of back to the blue light thing, how that affects us is it, it will eventually, it, it dehydrates our cells mm -hmm. for the most part. And obviously our cells need to be hydrated to function optimally. Um, so they're finding now that um, skin cancer, they're finding more and more cases in areas of the body that aren't even exposed to the sun. You know, it's like right. areas that are typically like under clothing and things like that. Yeah. So it's just, a lot of these things, are, they're, not, they're not adding up. And I think, again, it's more, the more that we're getting exposed to these non-native EMFs um, from all the technology that we're being burdened with, things are... The, the theories are starting to fall apart, and so people are starting to look in different directions, I think. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's, like I said, it's wildly complex, but... It's wildly complex, but it seems to me that the, the seems, more primal we get, yeah, the more back everything's to coming basics full we get. circle, yeah. Right. The yeah. more you can treat a lot of these things, <clears throat> which I love, you know, I'm... I'm I, I would I I'm sure just like you I'm always looking for the the uh least invasive most basic solutions possible to yeah. fix these problems you know and I love it I think it's uh I think it's the way to go and uh I wish more people would would and it's it's not that they're not taking the time to educate themselves it's that they have families and jobs and everything else yeah. they just don't have time that's know? right but listen to an hour and a half podcast and you can you know, on your way to work, you can figure a lot of stuff out. Yeah, or, yeah, or at least hopefully get pointed in the right direction to get yeah. more information for it. Um, yeah, it's, like I said, it's very complex. And again, I'm not saying go outside and get sunburnt. Um, but, uh, but, I mean, you know, take the time. And I've actually found that, uh, again, in the evening, the red light. So if you, say, you, you do go out late morning, afternoon, and you feel like your sun's a little bit, you feel a little bit of a burn. Stay out, you know, in the later evening when you have the sun starting to go down. They've actually found that those frequencies of light that you get in the evening, which are going to be more of the red, are actually going to be um, beneficial to the skin health. And so that's why, like, the juve and things are being yeah. used by athletes and, and everyone because the, the skin health, the way it affects the collagen in the skin, um, there, are, there are tons of benefits there and even athletic recovery. And they're even saying now it can improve a ketogenic diet. Really? Yeah. So, I mean, and all this from, you know, red light. And these panels also, I mean, these panels have red light and uh, infrared light, oh, which you can't see. I'm going to go out to Lowe's today and buy a big red light bulb. <laughs> um, what, uh, uh, oh, the other thing I wanted to ask you about is, um, I know she posted an article about uh, baby aspirin for heart health. What I didn't get a chance to read it, but what did you think about that? Again, I think that's just something that is... Uh, just that's, old that's the knowledge or an old yeah. thought, yeah. And I think, I think there's been several, you know, research studies done that found that that's just it's just not an effective way to reduce. I mean, maybe in like the immediate short term, yeah. Like if you're having a heart attack, yeah, take blood one because it'll it'll thin it'll thin thing. your blood. Yeah. But in the long term, it's just not beneficial. And in the long term, I think it's probably detrimental because I mean, every time you're taking one of those, it's going to be taxing into your liver and yeah. you know, other things like that because you're just introducing. Malcolm, chemicals. I always blame this on Malcolm. I got, I got a blood clot 
in 2016. So I'd had this really bad hip injury, mm-hmm. and I tore my adductor. I mean, completely tore it. Never got it fixed. It's still fucked up. Um, but my hip basically would just lock when I squat. I still have problems every now and then. And I think it's because of all that's worked in. Um, but I had Malcolm do RPR work on me. Okay. And uh, and for those of you who don't know, it's super. I mean, you're digging in there, you're moving stuff around. I felt fantastic when he was done. Um, got on an airplane. Next morning, went to Florida. Trained while I was in Florida. I was in pain in my leg, you know. I don't, mm-hmm. But something always hurts, so fuck it, you know. Trained again. Got in a plane. Flew home. As soon as I got home, came to the gym. Uh, I didn't get my workout in today, so I went right to the gym, hit some deadlifts. Leg is now throbbing. So I'm talking to my wife about it. I'm like, yeah, it's a spider bite. I think it's a spider bite. She looks at it. She does, she's a nurse. She's like, it's right. not a fucking spider bite. Go to the hospital. <laughs> so we go there, find out it's a blood clot. And I always blame it on Malcolm that he must have released something <laughs> in that injury. But uh, I went to this doctor who, uh, first, first of all, so you go to the, the doctor, the original doctor who diagnoses. No restrictions. So I get home. My wife's like, well, what are your restrictions? She didn't give me any. So she calls this friend of hers who's a doctor. I, now I'm not allowed to lift anything over 30 pounds for six months. I'm like, what, <laughs> what are you talking about? <laughs> Big you, difference. Yeah. So then we go to the Cleveland Clinic. And a doctor comes in. I wish I could remember his name because he was great. Um, kicks his feet up on the desk. He's talking to me. And uh, he's like, ah. He goes, I'm not seeing anything in your blood panels. I'm not seeing anything that, you know, this, I don't know what this is. He goes, um, he, I said, well, can I exercise? Yeah, I think, I think you're fine to continue exercising. And my wife's like, hold the boat. <laughs> Tell them what you do. And I was training to go over to Iceland uh, for the World Highland Games Championships, and I was going to lift this Husafell stone, which is like uh-huh. a 419-pound stone. <laughs> so I tell him. He sits back again. He goes, ah. he goes okay. Train at eighty percent. If anything feels funky, stop. Which was I thought was like the best. You know, yeah. he's he told me flat. He goes, look, I've never worked with anyone like you. He goes, I don't know how many people in my field have. Let's just see what happens, and we're going to put you on a blood thinner for a couple months. He didn't leave me on the blood thinner for a long time. I came back, everything yeah. was good again. My wife suggested taking a baby aspirin, and I still take it, but uh, I, I still have not. Th- found how that little teeny fucking aspirin is going to keep me from having another blood clot you know but yeah like i, said, I think it's just the because they know it thins the blood but mm-hmm. i think over time i mean your body adapts and right. so i think it's over time it just loses that effect but yeah and like yeah. you know i think there's been several research studies i've done to sort of disprove that in yeah the, in the long term as being a benefit yeah my uh red blood cell counts are usually pretty high but i go and give blood before i get in like i'm gonna go this week give blood before i get on an airplane and i don't know if that <laughs> but it just it's for my mental you know state but uh yeah yeah it, it's um it's interesting i'm i've been looking at the stuff you're posting and and following you now closely it's amazing that i didn't know who you were and the one time i asked for people's advice on who to have on the show everybody comes back with your name <laughs> yeah hopefully that worked out for you hopefully it wasn't a mistake and you never did no that again, i'm but. super psyched <laughs> this has been fantastic and uh i appreciate you coming up um do you do anything you want to plug anything like the practice if you're in the finley area or uh, not really i mean um I, i'm in the finley area and like i just started i'm i'm trying to start as a mobile practice okay so like i'll you set something up and i'll bring my table to your house and set That's it up there and yeah and so i'm sort of feeling it out there i'm not i'm not sure if could be finley would be you might want to get big a enough, bodyguard. Yeah. <laughs> I, i'm not sure if finley would be a, a big enough area for that but yeah. i think i think a lot of people would uh would benefit from it because i mean everyone's super busy so like in the office if i see you know a family or like if i see mom she comes in she's got four kids with her and she's trying to keep them contained or entertained within the office if i can just come to her house and they can you know play with the stuff that they've already got there in their own home where they're more comfortable it's going to be a lot easier for both you could set up in a place like this too you know gyms you know i've had chiropractors out here and physical therapists out here before and um it's always a pain in the butt because they're not really set up to like take payments and shit but um I think if they yeah. set up better and, and plan it out a little bit better, they yeah, would be a lot a, more successful. The, the EHR software that I'm 
think I'm going to switch to. It's super easy to do, like, on, like, so I can just, like, click, send this person an invoice. They'll send right. me an email with a link that they can just go and pay online. And so it's, I mean, everything like that sort of getting streamlined and easier yeah, now. Yeah, but do everything from your phone. As long as it's yeah. not in the morning or right before you go to bed. Anyway. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> All right. Thank you for coming on the show. I would love to do this again sometime. And, and, yeah. and let's... Uh, the next time you get down a rabbit hole, next time you got something you want to talk about, we'll just set it up and come in here and talk because I think it's beneficial for people to hear this stuff. And yeah, uh, or even if I mean, there's anything like I said, there's I sort of like hit a lot of different things sort yeah. of vaguely today. But if there's anything you want to talk about more specifically, we can sort of look into that. Absolutely, and try to spend more time on one single topic. You're gonna be my go-to guy. I'm telling you, I'm psyched. All right, uh, I guess that's it. This has been the Refined Savage. See ya.